Hello all, and yes, a second video on New Year's Day from me. Aren't you lucky? Okay, so there's a YouTuber called Tick. I'm not familiar with him, but people alerted me to a video that he made recently in which he cited a few videos of yours truly, as well as Henry Hazlitt, Thomas Sowell, and a whole host of other economic heroes. However, the comment section is a disaster zone of leftism. And although I understand what he was trying to do in this video, that is isolating productivity as a key factor in determining wages, I think he ran into some issues in the model he used to explain this. I'll link the video below, but to cut a long story short, he imagines a bakery in which total output is 100 loaves of bread, total revenue for the owner is $100, and total wages for the 10 employees is $10 each. He then starts to complicate this in order to draw out the principle that productivity and wages are linked. Now, while of course I agree with the overall point he was trying to make, I want to explore why this particular model ran into some open goals for leftists in the comments. One issue is that he seems at once to use this bakery uh, to both model the firm and society as a whole. So these workers both produce the bread and then buy the bread with their wages as if this is the sum total of the economy and then other products are added as he continues. This runs into some trouble from the get-go because the leftist will simply say that the capitalist has no need for existing here. Now take likely understands this already but given that this was his first attempt to explain basic economics to most of his audience i think there are a number of crucial things he needed to establish prior to getting to this bread factory and i think it would be interesting to go through them here the first is essentially summed up by my video uh, pricing a cup of coffee that is the price of the bread is not fixed by the capitalist but rather determined by the preferences of the consumers. And so the revenue of the capitalist is not fixed at uh, $100, but rather uh, this is the sum he hopes to earn in his entrepreneurial forecast. Now, if this is true and the capitalist hopes to gain $100 from selling the bread, he'd never set the wages at $10 each for the workers. He'd have to set them at a maximum of $9 each, otherwise he makes no profit. Let's pretend at the end of the week, the bakery makes $100. Well, in this scenario, the workers maximum would have to get $9 each and the capitalist makes $10 profit. But if the bakery only makes $90, then the workers still get $9 each as per their contract and the owner breaks even. If the bakery only makes $80, then the baker makes a $10 loss and so on and so forth. Of course, the difference between what he pays the worker and what he gets in return is explained by their differing time preferences. The workers get paid up front, whereas the capitalist must delay consumption in order to make a return. I feel like if Tick had explained this up front, then many of the comments about exploitation would not have been raised. I realize he linked to my video on why workers are not exploited in the notes, but of course most viewers are not going to watch links. So just to explain, I think he missed a trick here by uh, one, uh, not assuming that the uh, owner was gonna make a, a profit, um, and two, by not explaining that the owner could indeed make a profit or a loss, that that $100 is not uh, a given, but simply something that he's forecasting. The second key issue is that he explains the mechanics of trade being a positive sum game and not a zero sum game very well. I recognize some uh, parts of that. Uh, but then he misses the crucial fact of specialization and the division of labor. That is the thing that makes trade a desirable thing in the first place. The society would never just be this bakery. There would always have to be at least two consumer goods in the economy uh, in order for this uh, bakery to, to exist even. And this fact must come prior to any hypothetical simulation or you run into some of the issues that you see in, in, in that comment section. Let's pretend that you have two groups of people, uh, rival nations, let's say. One of them is better than the other in every respect. The reds are more knowledgeable and more skilled than the blues and therefore have uh, greater production capacity. 
The reds can make one shoe every three hours and one t-shirt every two hours. The blues, inferior in every way, can only manage one shoe every five hours and one t-shirt uh, every four hours. So why, in this scenario, would the reds ever want to associate uh, or trade with the blues? As per David Ricardo, provided that each group specializes, they should trade. In 60 hours, the combined production of the Reds and the Blues would be 32 shoes and 45 t-shirts. However, if the Reds specialize in t-shirts only, that is using the 60 hours they would have spent on shoes on t-shirts instead to produce only t-shirts for 120 hours. Uh, and the Blues did the same with t-shirts. Their combined production would be 60 t-shirts and 24 shoes. This is more efficient production because while Red's total production capacity is greater than Blue's, Blue's produce shoes at 1.25 times slower than they produce t-shirts, while Red's produce them 1.5 times slower. After one month of production, let's pretend the Red's and the Blue's trade. The Red's offer 60 t-shirts for 48 shoes, which is exactly uh, their exchange rate at 1.5. Uh, the Blues work out that this wouldn't be good value for them as their exchange rate is 1.25, so they haggle. The Reds cannot go up to 48 uh, shoes or they'd be getting no value, so they agree somewhere in the middle, let's say 43 shoes. And so to compare, both the Reds uh, and the Blues end up with greater value than they would have done without trading. To try to make this more clear, let's convert this into some money amounts the Red use let's say red pounds and the blues use the blue dollar one shoe is three red pounds or five blue dollars one t-shirt is two red pounds or four blue dollars we can see that the reds have made nine red pounds and the blues have made 16 blue dollars so they both end up uh, better off however the other great gain made is unseen here if the Reds and Blues devote all 120 hours to t-shirts and shoes respectively, it means that they no longer need to maintain the factory they are not using. In fact, rather than shutting down, they could use those factories now to make other things. They could reallocate resources to more productive ends, and so we can end up with even more goods. And so it goes on. And in fact, to give um, Tick credit, he does go on to explain some version of Say's Law later on in the video. All economists, including Marxists and Keynesians, agree with specialization and division of labor as being uh, net benefits in the way that I've explained. This is basic Ricardo. And so some explanation of this up front, I think, would have put them in a harder position to disagree with what Tick later wanted to say about productivity and wages. Finally, a third wrinkle he might have put in there is that it is not productivity per se that determines workers wages but the owner's perception of workers productivity it's a subjective valuation that may or may not be correct and may be under or overestimated my favorite example is probably when itv paid a total of 5.75 million pounds to lure des Lynham from the bbc's match of the day to front their football coverage but the premiership the new show uh, averaged only 3.1 million viewers in their prime time 7 p.m slot uh, that itv put it in uh, getting outdrawn by the likes of the weakest link which had an average of 7 million viewers in the same time slot on BBC One. Now, old Des was a perfectly fine presenter, but the executives uh, at ITV clearly overestimated his specific drawing power in what uh, had made Match of the Day a success on BBC One. There was a similar misvaluation of star value uh, to a product back in 1992 when World Championship Wrestling otherwise known as WCW, paid Jesse Ventura $350,000 a year to do colour commentary for them. Again, Jesse was a fantastic commentator, but he didn't bring in enough viewers on his own to justify the enormous salary that WCW gave him. In the cases of both Lynham and Ventura, TV executives 
miscalculated what had brought in large audiences to the shows they hosted. Now, I know this uh, adds the kind of layers of complication that Tick didn't want to get into, but I think that throwing this in there may have disarmed those leftists who are getting ready to complain about CEO pay and fat cats and all the rest of it. It's perfectly possible that many uh, boards do miscalculate the value of their CEOs, as Daniel Kahneman's work has shown. But it's all perceived value, just as we perceive the value in any other product and pay accordingly. Now, I wasn't trying to be pedantic uh, in this video here, but rather trying as best as I can to help Tick with the barrage of negative comments and insults he's had from the people on that video. It's quite striking if you, uh, if you go and read them. Uh, also, I think it's useful uh, to sum up and to note some of these things here for my audience too. Just in general, it's good to recap on these things. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, the Crimson Satyr, the Ambivalent Onion, Andy Swainson, Bailey Inarora, David Vacherche, Christopher Scholholm, Natural Rights, Binary Surfer, Holy Spatula, Hornito Jones, Kazga, Michael Tynan, Time Stealer, Toyo Tommy Ami, Tragic Vision, William Angus, Blake Barrows, and Edward Darrow.